Right, welcome back to the FNZ 90 Plus Free podcast where free football supporters take a look into the dressing room, chat to former professional footballers about their experiences on and off the pitch. I'm your host, Ashley Simons. I'm sure a number of our listeners are on Facebook, so why don't you give our, give our page a like, search FNZ Football and don't forget to share the page with your mates. Tonight I'm joined by Armchair and Tux. Boys, how are you doing tonight? Yeah, good mate, yourself? Yeah, not too bad. Armchair, how are you doing mate? Yeah, Comfy? I'm good, yeah. yeah, not too bad, thanks. Good, good. Right, so a little conversation twister tonight. If you had to choose between Manchester United or Man, Man City, go on, nearly went there. What would you choose and why? Go on, Andy, you go first. Um, I'd probably say it's got to be City for me. Always followed uh, Pep since, well, when he was at <laughs> Barcelona. I'm a Barcelona fan um, as my overseas team. Um, and, and yeah, for me, it's, it's, it's City. So you just follow the dough then, yeah? Is that what you're saying? Don't follow the dough. Don't follow the dough. I hate, I, I hate big money clubs in terms of just splashing <laughs> the cash and buying titles, but I do like Pep. Tux, what about you, mate? Um, to be honest, neither. Um, but if I had to pick, um, prob- well, probably City, just purely because of that Aguero goal. But when I was growing up, I fucking hated... Um, Sir Alex Ferguson with passion but then you realise what a great job he did uh, once he retired but um, if, yeah I'll probably have to pick City if I if you had to pick Christ got two glory hunters here tonight anyway let's get on to it tonight we're joined by a former defender he played his trade not only in the British Isles but in Australia and Indonesia he made over 90 appearances for Nottingham Forest and was part of the Colin Coldwood side that won promotion to League One for Northampton it's Chris Doig. Chris, welcome to the show. How are you doing tonight? Good, thanks, lads. Nice to be here. Yeah, good to hear, mate. Good to hear. So, Chris, as you're uh, a new, yeah, new to our show, you won't be familiar with the format. So let me set the scene for you. Just imagine you're in a pub and you've had one too many beers and you're willing to share your whole career with three complete randomers. Is that okay? Yeah, won't take long. <laughs> Tux, take us away with the questions. Actually, no, it's not even Tux this week, is it? We're going with Andy this week. Andy, unusual pedestal for you, mate, but take away the questions. Right, so sorry, guys. There's been an interruption here. Andy, obviously not used to taking the questions and Tux's post office connection interrupting us once again. But Andy picks up with Chris after he found out that he was a Rangers fan. Being, being a young kid wanting to play football like a lot of us, did you always want to play for Rangers or was there another team that you really you know, set your sights on? You want it to be there? No, well, I actually played for the Rangers when I was younger. I trained with them from 10 year old, uh, 10 to 14. Um, but it was difficult for me because I kind of lived so far away. You know, it was a big effort for my family to take you up. You know, I used to train once, twice a week. You know, you'd have games at the weekend. Uh, and it, when it came back to when you got to 14, it was schoolboy forms in Scotland at the time. And, I got offered I got offered school by forms at Rangers and you know my family were very big in education as well and when it came to the decision I ended up signing for my local team Queen and South who were second division in Scotland at the time uh, again I wasn't pressured into it in any way I just felt it was the best thing for me to do taking my school and education into account as well and, uh, big believer really if you're good enough you'll get you'll get found eventually, you know, and there's two ways of really doing it. You can go to a big club and make it or filter down into teams or you can start off at a smaller team and if you're good enough, hopefully, you know, someday will come and sign you and, and take you to a bigger club as you go. So that's the route I went down and fortunately enough, that's, that's what happened. Yeah, so you moved through there, you've set up, um, eventually making make an appearance for, well, making four appearances for Queen of the South. In, yeah. in in their first team, how how was that moving through through the setup there? Uh, yeah, it was good. I was actually I was Queen's youngest player. I was sixteen year old when I made my debut. Uh, I remember it now. We even met up at hotel for pre match, which was kind of on aired off. And I got asked what I wanted, and I had no idea. I'd never had a pre match in my life. And somebody said a cheese omelette, and I said well, I'll have a cheese omelette. And I just didn't. I just followed. We said pine chips. I probably said pine chips. I had no clue what to order. So. Uh, yeah, I came on as a substitute second half, but 
again, look, there might have been a bit of politics involved as well. I know there was clubs interested in signing me and, you know, for a club like Queen of South, if he ends up playing in the first team, then they probably command more of a transfer fee. So, uh, like you said, it was it was good to get it. You know, I like said I played four four games. I think I missed a couple. With, I missed one with concussion, being away with the Scotland schoolboys at the same time. But, you know, it was a great experience for me. You were, you were playing in men's football. You know, you were playing against guys who'd been playing in these lower leagues in Scotland for years, you know, and it, it kind of showed me even then the kind of physicality and everything that was involved in a seniors game, you know, so it was a good experience for me and like you said, there was probably a bit of politics involved in it as well and come the end of the season, that was me, I got moved on. Yeah, so I was, I was going to ask you about that, so you're only making four first-team appearances, you then uh, move, move over the border to Nottingham Forest into England. How, how, how come a move like that came about after you'd only made four appearances? I think it had been in Northern for a while, to be honest. I think I'd been playing in, I think I'd played in three Scotland set-ups that year and the year before, the, the kind of national under-16s team and the schoolboys 15s, which is the victory shield that it was back then, uh, and the schoolboys 16s as well. And you know what it's like, there's scouts all over, you know, that it's worse now. There's, you know, kids seven and eight now, they're getting scouted, you know, so... They're well aware of, you know, lads at, at lower level clubs who might be available for a kind of small transfer fee. And, you know, I think they'd been contacted before I got in the first team and they were well aware of me. But, you know, once you make a first team debut, all of a sudden there's every club under the sun's coming to have a look because, again, they don't want to miss out on something. So I had a, I had a decision to make at the time. There was, a, there was a few clubs that were interested, but, you know, I think I'd been down to Forest previously and, you know, I, f- I felt comfortable there when I when I visited, and you know, I think there was a last kind of minute. I think pitch from a couple of clubs that were trying to get me, but you know, I'd kind of give my word to Forest, and you know, even back then, I felt if you gave your word, you'd just stick with it. So I went down to Forest, and uh, sixteen decided that was the best for me, and I went down, and again when I went down there, actually everything had changed over the summer the kind of regime I'd signed for had got replaced and a new academy manager had come in so you know it was a it was a fresh start for everyone really but you know one that I was excited to, to go on You joined Forrest as a youngster as we said there Stuart this would have been at the helm at the time late signed under contract under Dave Bassett However, it's important to note you played under no less than nine managers in your time at City Ground. Uh, some <laughs> huge names. Um, not, only, not only the two we just mentioned, but Mickey Adams, Ron Atkinson, David Platt, Paul Hart, Joe Kinnear, Mick Harford and Gary Megson, to name every single one of them. Firstly, would you say, who would you say is the most influential manager out of all of those? And secondly, was it hard for a youngster to make an impression for a club who seemingly couldn't hold down a manager at the time? It was... It's difficult with a young lad going to a club anyway to make to make an impact. You know, it's like say I'd all be at Scottish second division, but I'd played a few first team games in Scotland and you go down to, to England, I go down to Forest and you're a sixteen year old and you're at the bottom of the ladder, you're as low as it can go. You know, it's you've got to prove yourself in the youth team to get into reserves. It was reserves football back then, proper reserves, you know, playing against first team players, not this kind of twenty three stuff we have now. You know, you've got to get into that and then, you know, you're proving yourself at every level. So uh, I was quite fortunate. I It was actually, well, Dave Bassett had taken over uh, and Mickey Adams and I played in a pre-season game, a reserve friendly uh, when I was 16 and Mickey Adams was, he took the game and we weren't very good. He, and Mickey after the game went through everybody except myself and one other. And I mean, went through everybody. He wasn't, he wasn't impressed. But I made a good first impression. And I think that kind of stuck with Mickey. I made a good first impression in Paul Hart, who was academy director at the time. So that kind of stood me in good stead, really. You know, I kind of, I had their confidence from the beginning, but I've got to keep that, you know, I've got to keep that going. And, you know, I was very fortunate that they took to me, they liked me as a player, you know, and very quickly moved me through the kind of, uh, the levels I was playing reserves, still 16, but by October I was in the reserve team. 
I'm kind of fluctuating between reserves and youth team. So I was getting exposed to men's football a lot sooner. And like you said, it's everything. If you've got the manager's support, you've got half a chance. But I mean, I mean that year Forrest got promoted to the Premier League. So, you know, you were never, ever going to get in the first team, you know. But it's a long process when you're a 16-year-old signing for a, a, a kind of big club in England, you know really any club in England it's a, it's a long process to go from youth team to first team so uh, it's like I try and say to players now there's always somebody watching you you know you've got to impress every training session every game and that's that's the way it is you know and it's it's as much about attitude as well as, as what you do on the pitch and you know I was a pretty determined lad when I was younger like I said I wanted to make I was determined to, to have a career in the game and I think my coaches respected that and liked that in me so uh, it, it, it bode well for me but like you said there was a lot of managers during my, my spell there I don't think all of them I don't think it was my performances were the result for a lot of the managers maybe it was I don't know but yeah it was a lot of I mean Forest was a big club they were used to being in Premier League like I said they got promoted that year into Premier League they got relegated the following season and you know I think the fans there's big expectations to be in the Premier League and you know, when things weren't quite going well, I think there was a lot of unrest with fans and that kind of led to the, the changes that, that you talked about. Well, it's important to know you did actually make your Premier League debut, didn't you, in, in that period? Am I right in saying you made two appearances in the Premier League? I did, yeah. I was, uh, yeah, 17. Uh, made my Premier League debut away at, at Man United on Boxing Day. Bloody uh, hell. Yeah, I started at the top and worked my way down to the top. So <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it was, uh, look, it's always a talking point. If somebody speaks to me, it's always, you know, my debut at Man United, you know, and like, you know, no better place to do it, I guess. You know, that was the year Man United did the treble, won the, the European Cup and Champions League. And, uh, you know, it was a great experience for me. And that was, I came on as a sub that game. I made my full debut a couple of weeks later under. Mickey Adams, who was caretaker manager at the time, Dave Bassett got sacked in between the two games. Uh, Mickey and Mickey chucked me straight in. Again, it was probably as a, a reward for what I'd been doing, but I've no doubt my first performance in that pre-season game I talked about can I, you know, what what's in my favour really? I think Mickey had the soft spot for me, and you know, thought I'm giving this boy a go, you know. So yeah, uh, yeah, I got a couple of appearances and. You know, that was it for that season, really. I was kind of, I travelled a couple of times. Big Ron Atkinson came in and I travelled with the first team. But I think that was, again, just to get more experience and see what it's like being involved. So, uh, you know, I was fortunate as a young lad. I got to see a lot at that level. Uh, it certainly opens your eyes and makes you realise, you know, the effort and what's required to, to play at that level. Yeah, so obviously you, you found first team opportunities quite regularly during your time at, at Nottingham Forest, you would probably say. And up until your last season, obviously 24 years old, you managed 21 championship appearances. But obviously then, unfortunately, the club were relegated to League One. Um, what impact did that have on you as a player? Uh, well, it sounds daft. That last season was probably, in my memory, it was probably the most consecutive games I played with Forrest. I'd, uh, I'd suffered a lot with injury. I'd, I played quite regularly with David Platt. Uh, and then I ruptured ankle ligaments. was out for five months. Uh, kind of finished the season with him. And I remember having a meeting with him and him saying to me, look, you know, I'm, I'm not giving you a new contract. I'm expecting to get offers for you next year. You know, he kind of had big ambitions for me, big expectations and, at the end of that season, David Platt left to go and become England 21's manager uh, with Sven Gorn Eriksson. And I ended up rupturing my cruciate kind of quite early to start of the next season. And then, you know, that's out in folds. I struggle really to get back in the fold. Good players come in. You know, the club, Des Walker came back to the club. Michael Dawson progressed through the ranks when I was out. And, you know, you're coming back and competing with these guys when you've been out for a long time. And it's very hard to get back in. And, I think it wasn't really until later on that season with Gary Meggs and well, Mick Harford actually chucked me back in the team. And then Gary Meggs came in. I felt as if I'd played my most consecutive games. But uh, I think really, in hindsight, for my career, I maybe should have left earlier than I did. 
you know, I needed to go and play regular football again. It's something, a lot of the stuff I say to people I coach now is probably through my own experience. And, you know, I say to lads, the most important thing is that you play games of football, first team games of football. doesn't really matter the level. It's You've just got to play and learn the game. And, you know, I think that's from myself really not playing regularly quick enough. You know, like I said, I got into the team early, but suffered with injury, but never really got consistent, a real consistent, couple of seasons in the first team uh, various like I said injury and a couple of other reasons but uh, the most important thing is to play games which is tell lads and when I left obviously I went to Northampton after that and that's when I started to become what you would call a proper first team player in my eyes and that's when I felt I became a better player really Yeah so you mentioned there obviously following the relegation to League One you took a further step down to League Two to re- return to a club you spent a brief spell um, at previously, obviously Northampton Town. Um, Colin Calderwood, the manager at the time, ironically a guy who ended up at City Ground after, you know, that's that first season you spent with the club in which you were you were promoted to League One. You know, tell us about that first season at Six Fields. It was a brilliant season. Brilliant season. I knew Colin, Colin was a player at Forest. He was somebody I really respected and uh, when Colin came in for me, I didn't really have any thoughts about being League Two. I just thought it was a chance to go and play for somebody that I respected and and, and try and play regular football. And you know, that's the way it works out. Uh, it was just a great season, great lads, real good team spirit, a lot of experienced pro- pros that had played at a higher level. These guys like Sean Dyke, Ian Taylor, Martin Smith, Ian Jess. Jason Lee came in later on in the season. Guys that had been there and done it. And uh, we just had a great team spirit, great camaraderie. And, you know, it ended up with promotion to League One, which is what really the aim was at the start of the season and what kind of expectations were as well. Yeah. So, obviously, following the promotion, Coldwood left for Forest and, and John Gorman stepped in. Until Stuart Gray came in, you managed to finish 14th and 9th consecutively in League One. A massive achievement for the likes of Northampton, would you say, at the time? Yeah, well, I was actually speaking to, well, it was about other clubs really, but to my mate earlier, and we were punching way above our weight, to be honest. I think in League Two, we were expected to get promoted. I think we had a, a reasonable budget, not that I knew it, but I think we were one of the teams that should have been getting promoted. But I think every year after that, as far as I'm aware, the budget kept getting cut. So... I think really, when you look at it, it was only a matter of time before we probably suffered relegation. But them two seasons that you've mentioned, I think, you know, for what the managers were having to deal with uh, from the board and budget and what have you, you know, I think we were massively overachieving, certainly to finish ninth. We were actually contending for the playoffs for quite some time. It wasn't until kind of Easter time where we fell away. So, you know, we we were punching above away and, you know, probably credit to the players we had, which are good players, you know. Uh, players yeah, that have come on. Squad, there's some notable names in those squads and, you know, and some some brilliant players coming through. I mean, it's Bradley Johnson came through at Northampton at the time that you were there. Made yeah. hardly any appearances, but, you know, look at what, what kind of player he became. It just Bradley actually to went club. and loaned to Stevenage. Stevenage won the conference. And... Uh, he wasn't getting any games. Colin Calderwood signed him and he was only a young lad. Uh, and then the next season he went alone to Stevenage and he just loved playing games. He was playing week in, week out in the conference. And I can remember it was like yesterday, he was training with him and John Gorman, sorry, John had just left and Stuart Gray had came in and Brad was head and shoulders above everyone in training. And I remember he pulled me and he was chatting. He says, I'm, I'm going to Stevenage. I'm moving to Stevenage. And I says, dude, don't be so hasty. I says, look, there's a new manager. I says, if you keep performing and training like you did today, 100% you're going to be in the team sooner rather than later. And he was kind of, I think it was just the lure of playing games, you know, at Stevenage is what he wanted. And, you know, he didn't go, he stayed. He actually played in the team that, that following weekend. And then that was it. You know, I think very quickly Leeds came in for him, if I'm right in saying, and that was him. He was off to Leeds. You know, he was, like I said, he was head and shoulders above everyone when he played. He was a, he was a man in a in a young body, really. You know, he was physically very strong, great left foot, good in the air. And I think it was pretty obvious for everyone to see that he was going to go on to a, a higher level. And he's still going now, to be fair. Yeah. 
So, um, the next couple of years saw you get off to Australia and Indonesia to ply your trade. Um, talk me through uh, that decision first and foremost to leave fo- the football league. You know, you knew well, um, and then going on to represent two teams that many of our listeners may not actually be familiar with. I just wanted a fresh challenge, man. To be honest, I was. I'd always had this desire to play abroad. And there was a part of me that, you know, I think America was a big appeal to me at the time. And uh, I remember speaking to the agent and says, look, I think it's time for me to, like, fresh start. Mention America and this was during the season and uh, there was nothing really in America that came out. And he says, but I've got, <laughs> there's an offer in Australia. I thought, Australia, that's, wasn't really an equation to be honest, you know, it's so far away, but I was single at the time, you know, I no family, you know, it was just myself really. So, uh, you know, it was just down to whether I wanted to give it a go or not. Spoke to a few people. They encouraged me to, to go and experience it. And I did. And it was, yeah, one of the best things I did, to be honest. It was a really enjoyable two years. Uh, some good people again. Great team spirit. Great group of lads. It was Central Coast Mariners was who I signed for, which are the kind of, uh, I'd be the smallest team in the A-League. Uh, financially, certainly, I think you're allowed a few different rules, but you're allowed marquee players and stuff like this. We never had that, you know. The, there wasn't a budget for marquee players, uh, but what we did have again was a great team spirit and a great group of lads, and just great times, you know. Really, my second year, I ended up with a new coach who is now soccer rules manager, Graham Arnold. Really good coach, as good a coach as what I probably had. Fitness coach Andrew Clark. By far and away the best fitness coach I've come across. A lot of stuff I would do now is based on what I did with Clarkie over in Australia. Uh, so it was a great experience. Again, a different way of living. You know, it was. I think people were very dismissive of you know when I came back or I had a break back home. Very dismissive of the standard of Australian football. Uh, you know, you just go there for the lifestyle. There's no doubt the lifestyle's a massive part of in Australia, but. The football was very good as well, and it was only getting better, to be honest. I was quite impressed with the standard. Uh, there was other guys out there. Robbie Fowlers was out there at the same time, MLS guys, guys like that. So it was its fifth and sixth season when I was there. So it was still growing, but, yeah, I really enjoyed it. And it's uh, I was going to say I should probably have stayed out longer, if I'm honest. But, you know, in the end, I decided I'd turn 30. I was still single. I wanted to go into my coaching badges and start planning maybe for the next chapter of my life. And I thought that was maybe better to be back here in the UK. So I made the decision to come back home. But yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have changed my spell in Australia for anything. Yeah, you obviously did come back and then um, had spells at York City and Oldershot Town. Uh, you then joined Grimsby Town in 2014, where you then took your first steps into coaching while at Grimsby as a player coach uh, before ultimately retiring as a player pursuing that coaching side further. Uh, this obviously led to a strong bond with Paul Hurst, who was the Grimsby manager at the time. I mean, you know, he's, as we go further into your coaching career, he's obviously been a fixture um, as obviously the manager and you being the assistant. So how did you two hit it off, obviously, first as a player and then as an assistant? Um, and then, yeah, as I say, led to uh, other other sort of areas with other clubs. Well, I'd went to York, obviously, we were in the, the conference at the time and we got promoted uh, via the playoffs at Wembley. Paul was obviously joint manager at the time with Rob Scott at Grimsby, so uh, we played against Grimsby actually in the trophy and in the league, so he would have watched me in them games. But uh, when I left the following year at York, a couple of the lads from York signed for Grimsby and uh, Grimsby were looking for a centre-half and had mentioned me to Paul and he phoned me. I'd never met Paul before. Uh, played against him but never met him or spoke to him and he called me and just asked me if I'd come in and do a bit of training with him he says I'm well aware of you as a player but I need to know you're fit he says look not a problem I'll come up so I trained for a a week played a couple of games the games weren't the the best Uh, they then asked me to play against Scunthorpe ironically the following week he says not a problem and uh, they pulled me both Paul and, and Rob pulled me in the car park afterwards and offered me a player coach's role, which was just out of the blue because it wasn't something that had been talked about. Like I said, I didn't know neither of them before it. Uh, 
I think they like having a senior player as a kind of coach within the setup they had at Grimsby because it's limited to what they could bring in. And that was it, really. I signed as a player. I think within six or seven games of the season, I think Rob had got sacked by the football club. Uh, so Paul was in sole charge. I was still a player, but I think started to do more and more of the coaching and helping Paul as the season went on, really. And uh, I think I played 30 games that year, but I think by the end of it, I felt as if I was more a coach than a player. Uh, ironically, I played in the playoffs against Gateshead, where we got beaten in the semi-finals. And then the bus back home, Paul told me and just said, look, if you had the choice of playing or coaching, what would you do? Uh, I was 30, I was only 33, and I just felt, you know, I felt my playing career was coming to an end. You know, it was it was only going one direction, that was downhill, basically. And, uh, I'd always wanted to go into the coaching side of it and I just said, look, if I'm being honest, I would I would go into coaching. So uh, he had plans to make me assistant manager. Uh, I was unaware of that at the time. I think there was a bit of stuff with the board that took a little while, but eventually that was it. He, you know, it got agreed and I got appointed as assistant player assistant manager. And, you know, I think certainly the first four years of our uh, relationship together it, it couldn't have went any better to be honest we were at Wembley five times in four years my first season as assistant we got beaten penalties to Bristol Rovers in the playoff final the club never had never really looked like getting promoted all of a sudden we were a penalty kick away from getting promoted the following year we got promoted at Wembley again beating Forest Green got beaten the, the trophy final uh, Paul then we got to League Two and we were in the playoffs in League Two very early in the season. But then the offer came for Paul to go to Shrewsbury and he went and he's, I was included as part of the deal basically. And you know that's just the way it's carried on. I think he's, I don't know. He must. You'd need to ask Paul probably, but you know I think he knows I'm loyal and I'm honest, and I think he appreciates that. And you know he's felt that's justified. You know he's wanted to have me by his side and. You know, that's the way it's turned out, really. it's When we've moved, there's not really been a decision for me to make. It's kind of been made for me. You know, when I left Grimsby, it was it was Paul that phoned me and said, a deal's done, we're both, we're both leaving. When we left Shrewsbury, Paul phoned me again, deal's done, we're both gone. There was no nothing for me to decide, really. I was kind of included in things, really, without having any say as such. So, you know, it's Paul that's, that's wanted to take me, but uh, he's been good for me and... Uh, you know, he lets me do a lot of stuff that maybe assistant managers don't get to do or I get to do a little bit more. And, you know, I've appreciated his his help and support as well. And, you know, we get it on really well. He's a really good guy, first and foremost, I've got to say. Uh, real honest guy. Um, and I like working with him. And, you know, that's the way it's panned out. So, Yeah. So during your time at Grimsby, you touched upon there um, as assistant manager, you finished runners-up. In the FA Trophy when Halifax Town found the winner at Wembley in a 1-0 victory. Uh, the team managed to put that disappointment aside when Grimsby went on to win the National League playoff in that year. Um, it was actually the other way around. Oh, was it? Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, we, well, we, got, we won at Wembley. The playoff final was the biggest game, obviously. You know, Grimsby were desperate to get back in the league. And when I was at York, we actually played the trophy final first and then the playoff final after. This time we played the playoff final and then the trophy final was the week yeah. after. And it actually bugs me a little bit looking back because I'm disappointed. We were just, everyone was so overjoyed about getting promoted back to the Football League. The trophy final became an insignificance, really. You know, I think we trained one day before it. You know, there'd been celebrations, and rightly so, because the club had been trying for years to get back into the Football League and finally we'd achieved it. You know, but I wish we'd kind of, looking back at it, I think we wish we took that trophy final a bit more seriously, you know, and, and said we won the double, you know, it's, I've been to Wembley a few times now, and the last few times I've not won and I've not liked it, you know, and it's, you go to Wembley, it doesn't matter what you're playing, who you're playing, you want to win the game, and yeah, like you said, it bugs me a little bit, but the priority was the league, which we did, but yeah, we got beat by Halifax a week later. Yeah, so after your time at Grinsby, you obviously said, and touched upon there about uh, going with Paul to Shrewsbury, um, 
they were battling relegation and ultimately grew stronger thereafter um, after you two joined the club. So in 2018, the club had two trips to Wembley, both ended in disappointment. Uh, firstly, with the EFL Trophy final, losing to Lincoln, followed by a pulsating match in the 2018 League One playoffs with Rotherham. Sort of take me through those highs and lows experience while obviously assistant boss there. I think the first season I still maintain the first season that we stayed up with Shrewsbury was our biggest achievement. I still maintain that. It's uh, we went to the club, they were rock bottom. The place was in turmoil. There was confidence was short with the players, there was a lot of infighting, there was just it was a mess, to be brutally honest. Uh, it was an aging squad with, in my opinion, players that weren't really weren't really bothered about being there or they maybe felt they should be at a better level or a, a bigger club. Uh, we had to turn that around very quickly. And really when we went in, the first game was just try to be in contention come Christmas in January where you feel you can make some signings in, in the window. And to be honest, the lads responded brilliantly. And, you know, we... We went on a great run. I think we can't remember what we did at one point. I think we won something like 10 games unbeaten or 11, 12 games unbeaten, something like that. For a team that was in the bottom, was quite a big achievement. And We managed to stay up, I think, second last game of the season. We beat Southend and I think mathematically we stayed up in the last game of the season. And we'd, we'd went through, like I said, a hell of a run in between that. So to stay up in the last game of the season... And having had promotion form for quite a large part of that, showed you what a kind of big job it was when we went in. Uh, I think Paul maintains now. I think he was he felt he was brought into the club to try and assemble a squad to get promoted out of League Two. But you know, fortunately, we we managed to stay up again. Credit to the players, really, they were the ones that did it. We had some good players, signed guys like young Tyler Robert from West Brom, who's only eighteen, magnificent, you know, and uh, performed well above their age, shall I say, and, you know, kept the club up and that allowed us to then obviously make changes in the summer, which the manager did, made a lot of changes to the, to the squad, uh, brought in a lot of fresh faces and, you know, that led to the, to the season we had. It was, it was a successful season uh, for what was expected and what we achieved. Uh, it's still great for me now that we never got promoted. Uh, I think we deserved it, really. Uh, Blackburn and uh, Wigan were the best team in the league by far. Blackburn, in fairness to them, you know, at the dodgy start, we were flying and I think Blackburn were unbeaten for the, the last 32 games. So, you know, credit where credit's due, Blackburn pulled it out. But I think we had a team that was far better than what was given credit for. You know, we've got, you know, you're seeing players now like Dean Anderson and, you know, he was just phenomenal. Ben Godfrey and, you know, John Nolan, they were just fantastic, really, amongst a lot of other lads. A great team spirit, a great group of lads who, you know, I go on about attitude and application a lot. That was, they summed up to a T, you know, their work effort, their honesty was phenomenal, really. And uh, it's just a shame we never managed to actually win something to to reward the boys, really, for the efforts they put in all season. You know, it was... A big disappointment getting beat to Lincoln in the, the trophy final. We didn't perform in the day. You know, I think, you know, Lincoln kind of, you know, they set up to kind of stop us playing and they did that well and managed to sneak a goal and won the game. And that was disappointing. But obviously, when you get to the playoff final, it's uh, for to take a club like Shrewsbury to the, to the championship would have been a massive achievement. And to get picked an extra time, you know, was very hard to take. But again, on the day, I don't. We we didn't perform. I don't think we performed. It was probably it was our sixty third game of the season. I think it was. I thought the lads looked very tired. It was Scots on that day, and on the day Rotherham deserved to beat us. They were the, the better and stronger team, really. Uh, it was just really disappointing that they just fell at the last hurdle, considering, you know, what the boys had put in and achieved throughout the season. Yeah. So obviously that success with Shrewsbury then. Uh, led on to uh, a move for you and Paul to Ipswich Town, obviously a club that us three know quite well. Um, they came calling for Paul's services in May 2018, which ultimately led to you teaming up with him again. Um, but unfortunately for you both, uh, Paul's time there only produced one win in 14 games and he was sacked in the October of that season. 
Um, so talk me through that period of your career and what was obviously a disappointing spell for everyone associated with the club. Yeah, it was uh, disappointing for everyone, like you said, but none more so than me and Paul, you know. Uh, really went in there with a lot of excitement and a lot of high expectations of doing well. Uh, and unfortunately, it just didn't work out. It didn't work out that way. Uh, I can't speak for anyone else. You know, I've got to speak for myself. And ultimately, I look back at my time and I wasn't good enough. You know, I, I evaluate my own performances and I wasn't good enough. You know, results show that. You know, we won one out of 14, like you said. So, obviously, I wasn't doing my job to the, to the best of my ability. And... Uh, Ultimately, you lose your job. You know, you win one in 14, you're not going to stay at a football club. And I mean, Paul went in really under the remit of, it was a long-term project, you know, went in under the remit of uh, changing everything from the first team, basically. I think the chairman wanted it completely overhauled in terms of, uh, he wanted it sports science-led, you know, he wanted the change in playing style and, you know, a lot of things that, I think he'd said to Paul when he went in, which, you know, it was going to be a long-term project to do what the chairman wanted, but long-term projects are not. If you don't win games in the short term, you ain't going to be there. So we didn't win games of football and, and paid the consequence. So like I said, I can't speak for anyone else, but I speak for myself. And, you know, I was part of the collective that was required to win games of football for that club. And we didn't win games and, like you said, results showed, obviously, I wasn't good enough. Yeah, so uh, obviously leaving Ipswich, you then uh, had a spell again with Paul at Scunthorpe United, but soon departed eight months later after a poor run of results. Um, so after your time there, and obviously at Ipswich, you linked to other manager roles in your own right. I mean, what's, what's the future regarding your coaching career now moving forward? I mean, would you like to be maybe a manager in your own right or, you know, maybe another spell with Paul? I mean, what would you say is the future for you? Yeah, well, I, I, I'm not aware of me being linked to any jobs on my own right, to be honest, but my ambition is always to be a manager, has always been to be a manager. I didn't get into the game just to be an assistant. You know, Paul's very aware of that. We've got an open relationship. He knew fine well, even when I was a player at Grimsby, that I wanted to become a manager. And I think he probably expected me to have gone on and been one by now but uh, that's always been my ambition uh, I think firstly I need to get myself back into the game you know that's you know it all comes down to opportunities but you know I I just want to get back into the game of football and try and uh, get work in a game with the players and show people what I can do and you know if an opportunity arises where somebody's prepared to give me the chance to be a manager then you know ultimately that's what I would like to do uh, foot, like I say, football's been my life. It's all I know, really. I really enjoy the coaching side of it. I don't know if I'll be a good manager or not. You know, I might, I might do it and not like it. I might do it and be no good. But I would like to give it a go and, and find out. Uh, but I love the coaching side of it. I love, I love being with the lads. I love the camaraderie and the team spirit and you know everything that comes with being a, involved in football. And you know that's that's what I'd like to get back into. Where and when, I've no idea. It's obviously very difficult at the minute with football. I think there'll be a big impact moving forward on football clubs and, and how they operate. So things will probably become even more difficult. There's hundreds and hundreds of guys that have been in the same position as me wanting to get back into the game in some capacity. So it's uh, yeah, it won't be easy, but I feel as a player, ironically, I didn't believe myself. That was one of the reasons why I never, in my eyes, didn't fulfil my potential. But as a coach, I do. And I've got belief in myself as a coach. And you know, I feel I've got something to offer. And you know, I would like the chance to get back in. But I need somebody to give me that opportunity. So, you know, it's, will it be on my own? I don't know. Will it be with Paul? I've just got to wait and see and, and see what opportunities come up. And hopefully some do. Yeah, I think there's... Having obviously listened to you tonight, I think there's, um, you know, whether it be player or assistant manager or any sort of coaching role that you've had, I think one thing that is, you know, quite key and that is consistent is that you, whether you've had, you know, bad luck or anything like that, you've always got up and gone again, if that makes sense. And I think that's testament to you. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's been a pleasure to speak with you this evening and hear about your career moments. 
it's not often you get someone from the depths of Dumfries popping up in Indonesia kicking <laughs> up. Um, well, that's, I've got a few funny looks, I must admit, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, so one last question, um, Chris, in, in yep. terms of this channel. Uh, we've been after this player for a while now and uh, we ask all of our guests the exactly the ex exact same question every time. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever played with or do you know Deli Adebola? I've played against Deli Adebola, but I don't know him personally, no. Oh, boys, another one. That's another good. one, I think. Oh. Back to his I'll ask board. around if somebody knows Deli or last for years, not a problem, but I don't, <laughs> I don't know him personally to help you, I'm sorry. We're chasing his tail, mate. Look, from my, my sources tell me that we're uh, pretty close at this moment in time. Tux, how are you getting on with the search, mate? Yeah, I think the uh, the recruitment net is uh, closing on in, on Deli Adebola, so hopefully we'll have a, an update soon. But as I say, we are very much in the search for him. So we'll, well see. Well, remember, remember, guys, it's that hashtag find Adebola <laughs> or Del Boy Adebola as, uh, as uh, some of the players thought he, he may be known as. But um, look, going forward anyway, Chris, you know, best of luck. And hopefully that opportunity comes for you uh, sooner rather than later. Okay. Thanks very much. Appreciate that. All right, mate. Take care. Cheers, Chris. Thanks very much. Cheers, mate. Cheers, lads. Thank you. See ya.